Hello. We're ready to get started for the next part of our program. I first met our keynote virtually, sort of, when I saw his TEDx Charlotte talk through one of my feeds. What Trauma Taught Me About Resilience was the name of it, and I started watching and I couldn't stop. And when we started talking about purpose and belonging as a theme of this event, his name popped up in my head again, and I said, let me call and see if he might come. And we are very fortunate and blessed that he is with us today. We're happy to welcome Charles Hunt, who has led programming at some of the premier universities, colleges, Fortune 500 companies, and nonprofits across the country, helping thousands of students and leaders find their way to a better future through career readiness, life coaching, and direct hiring opportunities. His intense focus and drive has lifted him from poverty and debt to financial freedom while fueling his life's purpose to use his mess as a message that helps, inspires, and motivates others. Join me in welcoming Charles Hunt. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's an absolute uh, honor and uh, privilege uh, to be with you all this morning. Um, I absolutely love the theme for for the day, light your fire. Um, it's almost poetic that on a day where lighting the fire is the charge that, guess what? It rains. Uh, you're trying to build a fire, trying to build the heat, the passion, and a storm comes through and puts a little bit of a damper in the midst of those earnest, sincere, healthy, and wholesome goals. Um, and that's easily a metaphor for life. Um, so, you know, what do you do now? How do you have the resilience to fight through and light the fire amidst the proverbial and actually literal storm? So before we get too deep into this, um, I'm going to give a couple of seemingly irrelevant, but they're somewhat significant facts about me. Uh, one is I'm a huge fan of analogies. And two... I'm a huge fan of boxing and combat sports generally. Um, analogies are good because they help us make sense of concepts, of new concepts, with something that we're already familiar with. Like, it's related to something that we already know. Now, with boxing, uh, boxing is kind of the, the closest thing we have to primal, primitive life uh, or primal life. Uh, you know, you win or potentially die or uh, suffer significant damage. Um, but when you strip away all the violence um, and, you know, in some ways, absurdity of two people trying to knock each other's blocks off for money, um, it's actually a really beautiful, beautiful sport, right? To hit, but yet not get hit. Um, and there's a, a science and an art to it as well. You'll have all type of people who will step into the ring. They all have some sort of advantage. You'll have some people who are blessed with size, some who are best with speed, some have defensive instincts, some have power, um, natural physical abilities. And then you'll have some who aren't necessarily blessed with those same uh, innate tools, but through sheer hard work, through training, they're able to prepare themselves to also step into the ring. They'll add to that skill set. And regardless of whatever tools that they have, they're going to eventually step into the, into the ring. And then when that bell sounds, they have to fight, right? There's no backing out at that point. If you just stood still, then you're just going to get beaten senseless, right? And you're going to accept a loss. And that's unacceptable for any of us. The same is really true for us in life, right? Once we're born, we all are going to have to fight to get to the best of the life that we have. Um, sometimes just simply to survive or even stay alive. So as you listen to me over the next 
few minutes, um, I want you to think of yourself not only as a fighter in the fight of and for your own life, but also think of yourself as the trainer as well. Because as you put your gloves on and get ready to fight, you're also going to help coach and prepare the students who are coming into you uh, into your charge and helping them to fight and helping them to prepare and helping them to be resilient in the ring of life as well. So uh, Dr. Jenna uh, mentioned her work uh, in Oakland and it touched my heart um, as I was sitting there listening to her because that's actually where I hail from. I'm from Oakland, California, born and raised. Um, this image here um, is one of my favorites of Oakland. It's of uh, Lake Merritt, uh, it's nestled in the heart of uh, Oakland, uh, in the center of Oakland with the rolling hills in the back background. Um, Oakland is a very special place um, for me. Um, it's um, the birthplace of the Black Panther Party, um, uh, which, you know, they initially sought to um, monitor the policing of black communities amidst the death of multiple um, black people at the hands of police um, before they developed some broader aims to serve the community that was uh, over-policed and underserved uh, by its government. Uh, despite that presence of black solidarity, or maybe even perhaps because of it, Oakland also became ground zero for the crack epidemic that swept through America in the 80s. Um, and it turned my childhood into a, a war zone, a labyrinth of drugs and criminalization and scarce job opportunities and trickle down economics that never quite trickled down. But despite that, Oakland also has a very rich cultural and artistic history. We produce world-renowned scholars and artists and educators and actors and athletes. Um, we've had uh, one of the best basketball players uh, in the history of basketball, and Steph Curry, who's played for the hometown team. But we've also had uh, scores of hometown talent that's been developed as well. Uh, a few years back, I was watching a clip about uh, a documentary on Oakland's rich basketball history. Um, and it specifically chronicled two elite players. Um, and I actually had a bit of a connection to both of them. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Demetrius Hook Mitchell, he was a, a playground legend um, from my West Oakland neighborhood. And then another gentleman by the name of Leon Poe, who also went to the same high school I did some years after me. Um, they both came from my West Oakland neighborhood both experienced some significant traumas, but ended up on two completely different paths um, in, their, in their life. And there's a, as I was watching the documentary, there was a, 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 a very specific point, uh, some poignant moments that stood out for me. And I, I wanna show you here and I speak about the importance of it on the other side. One bad decision, then I can be in a situation where I'm at. There's got to be a person that you love as much as you love yourself. There's got to be something or someone that helps you get there. Where well, I learned everything since day one is Oakland. I never leave Oakland. Oakland is, is, is me. Oakland ain't a city that, that feels sorry for you. You got to push through tough adversity moments. And if you do that, I think you prevail. But if you don't, the city could swallow you up. So it was a 30 second clip uh, that packed in some very poignant moments, uh, certainly for me. There was some wisdom and statements around how you have to push through difficult times, uh, how one bad decision can uh, derail your promise. Uh, it's impossible to miss that, you know, one of the subjects is actually in jail. Um, you know, dreams, talent that'll never be realized. Now, while you focused on uh, you know, those and other images and sounds from, from the clip, my focus from that video was forever altered with this image. Now, sure, you know, I noticed the man that's sitting um, you know, on an office chair, garbage bag slung over, over his shoulder on the fence, but what really caused my heart to drop was realizing that 
the person that's sitting on the ground amidst the weeds and the, the trash that littered the landscape, that's the woman that gave birth to me. That's right, my mom was coincidentally captured in this montage of struggle and hopelessness as she battled her disease of addiction and was in and out of the jail system. So I'm one of the millions of children and adults who grew up with what is now very commonly known as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Um, many, of you, many of you might be familiar with the study uh, done by Kaiser Permanente and the Center for Disease Control. Um, in their study, uh, in their survey, fully two thirds of the population that was surveyed had at least one ACE, one adverse condition. Um, one out of every eight had four or more. And this is significant because the studies have also shown that children raised by an adult who had just one adverse childhood experience were 1,000 times more likely to develop ACEs of their own. Those with ACEs were two times more likely to have physical health challenges and three times more likely to have mental health challenges. And for perspective, of the 10 ACE categories, I actually circled seven of them. And an eighth probably would have been circled if my family had any uh, care for, or uh, medical care or medical coverage for mental illness. And I am not some anomaly here. My story, while it is there are some elements to it that are unique? It is very much the narrative and the story of not just what I face, but what many of your students may face as well. It's not just the childhood, uh, the adverse childhood experiences that we face. It's also the adverse community environments that many of our students, including myself, had to survive through as well. That those adverse community environments become the soil on which a lot of the students that you are experiencing, they're trying to grow through. The poverty, the lack of opportunity, the community violence, those all manifest in the trees and the fruit that become adverse childhood experiences. And they end up, again, showing up on your campus. And I know about these things, certainly from the research that I've done, but also from the School of Hard Knocks, from the actual lived experience. You see, I spent my entire childhood in or on welfare my entire childhood on welfare and most of my childhood in segregated economically deprived drug infested and crime ridden neighborhoods um, as i mentioned earlier you know my mother spent a little bit of time of jail a little bit of time in jail for the exact same disease of addiction that today's opioid users receive compassion and treatment for my father, unfortunately, he was murdered when I was 10 years old. I, I lived in a drug house at one point and watched from maybe 20 feet away as someone came through our apartment shooting guns. I didn't, I've been homeless as a dispute between my mom and the drug dealers who were operating out of our apartment, it became violent and we just had to move. One day we lived here, the next day we didn't. We didn't move so much as evacuated, taking whatever belongings we could in a bag. Uh, the next nine years, uh, I slept on the floor of my grandmother's one bedroom apartment, often not feeling loved, not feeling protected or feeling safe. Um, I've sat in classrooms when I've been hungry or 
disturbed about last night's drama or maybe worried about or anticipating the drama that's to happen uh, when I get home. Um, I've seen my mom's eye bloodied from domestic violence. I've heard the neighborhood shootings, the police sirens whizzing by, the police cars whizzing by. Like I know what it's like to feel, to experience things that are too old, too grown for youthful eyes. I know what it's like to be strong and tough when all you really wanna feel is safe and loved. But despite all of that, um, I've gone on to become a first generation college grad, a first generation advanced degree grad, um, owned a couple of homes um, after never growing up living in an actual house and actually having a positive net worth. Um, I've learned how to succeed despite those obstacles. I've had an unbreakable spirit. So the question then becomes, well, how? As you know, Langston Hughes once poetically intoned, life for me has not been, has been no crystal stair. Um, I've experienced more than my fair share of setback and, and heartbreak and adversity in life. Some of it was pure happenstance, bad luck. Um, I had no choice or no say in. But then some of it was also self-inflicted. Things that I did um, you know, to myself through you know, not knowing any better, poor decisions, immaturity, lacking wisdom. Um, you know, I've experienced the setbacks and the triumphs as we all have. That's kind of a part of life. But along the way, as I looked at my route to success, as I gone through, you know, sadness and pain and depression and guilt and a host of other feelings, there are two qualities that have been critical to my progress. Hope and resilience. So hope is the expectation or belief or desire for, for something. Um, there's an implied belief in its possibility, even if it's surrounded by improbability. Uh, and I really can't stress enough just how important hope is, uh, especially when we're facing some level of adversity. Uh, the smallest things in life can kind of uh, sway that hope in one direction or another and be the difference in your life trajectory, going in one direction or going in another. See, hope is what allowed me to believe in a better future. Um, to believe in the notion of possibility, even if it was shrouded in and I had reasons to believe that it wasn't probable. Um, when you employ hope correctly, um, hope becomes a reason or a, a cause. Like it's really that important of a force. Um, it's the foundation that all, of all else that we accomplish. Um, it all springs from that level of hope. And without hope, it becomes so much easier to make decisions that work against our own best interests. But just as critical as hope is, hope alone is not sufficient. We just talked about being able, we wanna light our fire, but just because we wanna light the fire doesn't mean that the circumstances are gonna allow for it. So that hope is not alone because we all are gonna hope for a better day, a better life, better things. Uh, but then we get some, some level of opposition, right? We get failures, we get setbacks. Um, and generally it's nothing personal. That's just how you know, life works. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have desires and dreams and then obstacles crop up, right? We want to live and live healthy and until old age, but then disease shows up to our door. Uh, we want to have financial freedom, but loans uh, may keep us uh, on, a, on a financial treadmill or, uh, you know, bad financial decisions. Um, we want to live happily ever after. And then breakups or divorce happens. Um, all the things that we want in life can somehow become obstructed by, you know, either a different or alternative uh, reality that we didn't necessarily envision. So just as strong as the hope that we carry for a better day is the resilience that we actually have to employ every day. See, 
while hope is what keeps our eyes fastened towards a better future, it's actually resilience that keeps us on the path towards it. So it's really not hyperbole to say that hope is the foundation on which the path to resilience is built upon. And on that path to better or to different or whatever it is we're trying to get to, we, we encounter change, negative change often. Resilience is the capacity to adapt to negative change and then to recover from that change as quickly as possible. Now, understand something. Resilience is not the absence of adversity, right? The, that, that adversity is a prerequisite and you will not be resilient without it. But that adversity also provides us an opportunity for growth and growing our resilience is ultimately about changing the way that we think about adversity. You see, it all starts right here in our minds. It's the subtle yet significant messages that we tell ourselves about what's happening to us and, and what we're doing in the moment. And it's a cycle, right? It's the beliefs, the inherent beliefs and thoughts that we have about ourselves, the way that we feel like things should be, what we are, our moral compass of what we feel is right and wrong. Those beliefs um, impact and manifest in the thoughts that we have. Those thoughts are going to influence the feelings that we end up uh, conjuring up. And those, con those feelings lead to the actions that we take and ultimately the results. You see, it's ultimately resilience that has allowed me to create my own from here to their story. And it's also the same thing that you guys have used in your life as you've encountered your adversity. So if I can, I wanna spend a few moments talking through a few principles that have been the foundational elements of building out that really, really important work of resilience. So when, th this might sound a little bit um, different for some people, but because of the way that I grew up, I made a choice when I was young to say that I'm not going to jail, right? That I had spent time visiting people in jail. I'd seen the impact that it had done to my life. That wasn't something that I wanted for myself and I wasn't going to go to jail. And I made the decision that I wasn't going to jail. Now at the time, I got a lot of things that are working against me. I don't have a lot of money. I got a lot of crime that's happening around me and uh, I have easy access to it, but I, determined in myself that that just wasn't something that I wanted for my life. And somehow I made it through the gauntlet and I can say that, um, you know, I never spent the moment in jail and a moment in jail and I'm proud of it. Now, now I don't like say that, say that to exact any praise because most people, um, you know, not going to jail should be the norm. Right. Um, but as a young guy, you know, going through the adversity that I felt and I experienced, um, I somehow never succumbed to believing that I didn't have the power and the ability to control my circumstances and then ultimately change them event, in, uh, eventually. Um, I believed that I could do better and I could be better. Um, and the same is true for us. We have an inherent amount of power, right? If I was to fall down on this stage right now, I have a bunch of different responses within me. So I have physical power to get myself up. If I was knocked down, I'd have the physical power to get up and defend myself and make sure that whoever knocked me down never ever does it again. I have the power to uh, influence by calling the authorities to say, hey, someone just harmed me. I have the power to heal. I have the power to do so many different things. And the only time we relinquish that power is when we simply stop believing that we have it. Power is the capacity to influence or to direct. Like there's a lot of things that we cannot control in our lives, but so many of us miss, <clears throat> excuse me, so many of us overstate and overestimate how much control we have and underestimate how much choice we have. And with choice, we have power. Every day we get to make a bunch of choices on how we're going to 
spend our lives, how we're going to allocate our time, our resources, and our thoughts. And even the most painful situations offer the opportunity for us to exert our power. Um, it's okay to acknowledge that there are times where we are a victim, but never own being a victim. I was a victim, but I am not a victim. Uh, no matter what happens to us, no one can take our thoughts. And that becomes very, very important for us in exacting our power. So I mentioned that, um, you know, I'm uh, from Oakland, California. Um, and while I've certainly had more than my fair share of challenges, I've also come to understand the power of perspective. So perspective is refer or refers to our particular way of regarding or looking at something. And that should make sense to us, right? Because the view that I have looking out at a sea of 100 people is a little bit different than the view that you have, everyone looking back at me, right? The perspective that we take matters in how we process what happens to us. It, ma it makes a difference in how we think and how we feel and ultimately how we're going to act. And here's the thing, so many of us will miss the blessing in things that we experience because we don't know exactly how to spot it. We don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, that thing that you feel like could be the worst thing that ever happened to you can also turn out to be one of the absolute best things to ever happen to you. It all depends on how you're going to look at it, how are you going to regard it. Uh, perspective aids in helping us make sense of things that would otherwise leave us broken, confused, stuck, or even broken. Uh, you know how soul-crushing it was to have a parent that was an addict or to lose my dad to murder? Um, as painful and as scarring as that was, a healthy perspective allows me to see that there's some blessing in it. Right? I am who I am specifically because of all of the adversity that I've been through. Um, sure, I wish I didn't have to learn it in such a, a painful and traumatic way, but I've learned independence. I've learned self-sufficiency um, and really how to harness how much power that I have. Um, I learned that life certainly can be tough, but that I'm tougher. I don't learn any of these things without adjusting my perspective on what happened to me, how I look at it, and then what I tell myself about it as a result. So there's a bunch of things that you are going to experience in life and many of you have experienced in life. And I challenge you to alter your perspective, to look at, look at it a little bit differently and not only to folk change what you're, uh, excuse me, how you're looking at it, but also what you are looking at? What is it that you are focusing on? So we can harness the value and the goodness that comes from the adversities that life, face, life will give to us. Um, I've watched and rewatched the video of my mom uh, a jillion times, um, just fixated on the despair that my mom likely felt um, before she passed away. Um, and it eventually, um, I hit on a nug another nugget from the clip, there was a statement that was made that said in order to overcome the many traps and obstacles and enticements to veer off the right path that um, there's got to be something or someone who helps you get there. Um, you know, as a kid, I didn't know what there was or I didn't have things all figured out. I just knew that I wanted something different in life. Um, but, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I'm I'm getting some small glimpses of a different reality, um, but I didn't have much of a network to expose me to much outside of Oakland. Um, but I, I was able to get a few glimpses here and there. And then from those, uh, those glimpses, I decided first to get educated. Probably the most impactful decision of my life to get my undergraduate degree. Um, that led to a nearly two decade corporate career um, and then a, su a successful career um, as an entrepreneur um, using my pain as art 
to help other people to live better and overcome uh, the obstacles they face. None of those things happen in my life unless at some point I make a decision and a plan and create a plan to get there. Um, you know, planning, it, it plays a pivotal role in helping us to build and harness our resilience. Um, it's more than a wish, it's more than a dream or, or a goal. Um, you know, we're undoubtedly going to face some situations that are going to, to be less than ideal and we're gonna have choices. Uh, we can either stay there or we can use the power that we have to actually act um, and change our circumstances. And a well-designed plan will help our, our resilience in two ways. So the first way, it can provide a path out and away from the adversity that we face. But the second way is a well-designed plan can actually prevent us from encountering that adversity in the first place. I think we all instinctively understand just how important planning plays in our lives because after we leave this auditorium here, all of you have designs to go somewhere else. This is not home. And you have a direct plan on how you're going to get there. You're going to take this street, make this turn, and you'll eventually end at that, end at that destination. If we didn't have a plan, then we would just wander aimlessly. We would just wander aimlessly and not get to the ultimate destination or take a significantly longer time to get to where we want, creating more stress and adversity for ourselves. A well-designed plan aids us in preventing those adversities from even showing up in the first place. So the work that you guys are doing as educators is very difficult work. Um, and I commend you uh, mightily for the work that you're doing and helping to shape the next generation of lives, younger and older. Um, but those students that uh, are coming uh, in front of you and that you guys are in charge of, those are some of the same people who are experiencing those adverse, uh, adverse childhood experiences that I spoke of. They're coming from environments that are very challenging. They're coming from uh, situations that are certainly gonna make it difficult for themselves and may even make it difficult for yourself. And then even for you personally, um, you may have your own adversity that you are dealing with. Um, you know, negative health diagnosis, uh, family discord that may be uh, hurting you to your absolute core, um, heartache, financial um, strife. Like the bad luck truck delivers 24 hours a day. Um, you know, life continues to happen um, and, you know, we don't often get a chance to, you know, call a timeout or regroup. And so in those instances, you know, when life is really, really challenging and it's really, really struggling and you feel like you're going through hell, that's when it's incumbent upon us to simply persevere. We have to fight through. Um, I'm a, many of you uh, may have uh, been familiar with the name Buster Douglas. Um, Buster Douglas, uh, you know, got his name to fame as he knocked out Mike Tyson. Um, and I love watching their fight because it, it mirrors so much of the things that I talked about earlier. And it's a model of perseverance. So Buster Douglas was six foot four. Mike Tyson was five foot ten. At the time, Mike Tyson is known as the baddest man on the planet, knocking people out in seconds. And no one gave Buster Douglas a chance. He was the largest underdog in betting history at that point. But they get into the fight, and I talk to you about uh, inherent um, strengths that individuals might bring into a fight. And, you know, Mike Tyson had ridiculous power and quickness. Buster Douglas also had some strengths of his own. One, that he was my, much taller than Michael, uh, Mike Tyson, and he also had a really good jab to keep Mike at bay. And so the fight plays out, and it, it's going beautifully for Buster Douglas. He's using the jab, he's keeping Mike Tyson at bay, hitting him with combinations, he's dominating Mike Tyson. Until the seventh round. Seventh round comes, Mike Tyson hits Buster, Duster, Buster Douglas with a hellacious uppercut. Sends Buster Douglas to the canvas, right? This is 
the very definition of adversity. It just so happens that the uh, knockdown comes at the very end of the round. Buster Douglas gets up. He's able to make the count. At the end of the round, he goes back to his corner. So he gets a minute to regroup. Instead of lamenting about how terrible his plight is at that point, round eight comes, and what does Buster Douglas do? He gets right back on his game plan, popping a jab, throwing combinations, keeps Mike, uh, Mike Tyson befuddled. So we get to the ninth round, and then he actually knocks Mike Tyson out. It was like the biggest upset in boxing. That man got up off the canvas from an uppercut that he did not see. I don't know if any of you have ever been hit with a punch you didn't see or a Mike Tyson punch. But I'm guessing it doesn't feel good, and I'm guessing it will make you reconsider a whole bunch of things about life. And in that moment, he got up continue to fight, continue to persevere. Our resilience is directly tied to our ability to endure, to experience and go through, and then to keep going. Like sometimes it's, it's not fair, sometimes it's not right. Uh, the timing may suck, it just doesn't feel good. You don't even know how, but it's our responsibility to continue to move forward. And, you know, understand that there's going to be some bad days, some bad weeks, some bad months, but it's still incumbent upon us to continue to fight. Um, we've got to be steadfast. We've got to be persistent. We've got to be purposeful and intentional about getting to the freedom that comes on the other side and doing the work. Like, we cannot sacrifice our future for today's pain and shortchange the plans that we've put in place. Because the worst of life simply cannot take out the best of us. One of the things that's so difficult about whiplash is, and so dangerous about it and so painful and makes it difficult to, to overcome is, you don't see it coming, right? Let's say you're, none of us text and drive, so we get, to, <laughs> we get to a stop sign and, you know, we decide to check our phone. And then all of a sudden, when you're not paying attention, you don't see it at all, someone comes up and they rear end you, smack you, right? And so now your neck snaps back, right? And you've got this really bad pain. A part of the reason why that's so painful is you didn't see it coming. Right? Normally, if you see danger, your body has a way of tensing up and protecting itself from the impact. Well, because you weren't prepared for it in a rear-ending accident, you end up sustaining a little bit more damage. It's so much easier to bounce back from adversity, from setback, if we're prepared for it. Like, we've thought through what the possibilities are. Uh, how we're going to respond or what exactly we're going to do in a circumstance. Uh, preparation will help us think through the different possibilities um, and especially, especially the, the negative ones. And that preparation serves as um, a reinforcement against the full impact, the full blow of the, uh, the impact of something that's going to come in and it's going to mute uh, that impact. Uh, the work that you guys do in helping to prepare the next generation of academic learners um, is so very important, not only for them in getting them to the next phase and preparing them for the next phase of their career, but it's also critically important for you as you get ready to get in front of them. What are the steps that you've taken to ready yourself for the academic year, for the myriad of students that you're going to face? you're going to lessen the amount of adversity that you're going to have to face the more that you prepare. And while we certainly cannot prepare uh, for everything, that doesn't mean that we can't be ready for, for something. So certainly I, I endured a lot of poverty. I survived addiction. I lost both of my parents. Um, I made it through significant amounts of neglect, and abuse and childhood dysfunction. Uh, I had job loss, I had an emergency surgery, um, all type of 
life setbacks. Um, and as I mentioned, the victory in all of them, it actually started in my mind. But another thing that I actually recognized was the most resilient among us will find a purpose in the trials that they face. They'll make sense of the adversity that they face by somehow finding some level of meaning in it, uh, a why. And then upon discovering what that why is, they're gonna put it to use towards the betterment of themselves or even for, for others. Um, instead of wallowing in my own brokenness, one of the things that um, I did was I started to take an inventory of my life and the different skills um, that I'd accumulated, the, um, the, the countless times that as a you know, little tiny uh, bald head chocolate boy that I did I have a dream speeches as Martin Luther King uh, every January. Um, the times that I acted and I sang and danced in, uh, in creative arts um, and learned how to perform uh, in front of crowds. Um, I think about the career skills that I built, um, you know, learning business uh, principles and giving presentations. Um, the, the life skills that molded me into, um, into all of the different experiences, the good and bad that helped me to get to where I am. And it got me to thinking like, so what if those things were actually supposed to happen to get me to where it is that I'm supposed to to be? What if those things actually happen to me for a reason? Um, and, and that's that perspective again, right? But what if all of those things happening are the very reason why I was able to get on a TEDx stage or able to be in front of you today to help maybe just one person who's going through some level of adversity or trauma? Um, when we realize that there's a purpose for the things that we experience, like we're then emboldened to believe that we can overcome and that we will succeed. And not just in spite of what we've been through, but specifically because of what we've been through. Um, and to take it a step further, like, you know, I'm certainly for fortunate that um, you know, I was able to find a purpose in the things that I've experienced, but even more to find out that I myself am purposed, right? To help broken people, not unlike myself, to find their healing and to find resilience. To help them see that, you know, they too can overcome whatever it is that life throws at them. Um, yeah, I've been fortunate to be able to turn my pain into art um, and give it a, pers uh, give it a purpose. Um, and, and I've learned that you'll never be able to unlock your destiny if you stay focused and stuck in your history. Um, and many of you, I imagine, are the same way. I'm not the only one who's experienced significant life adversity. Um, you guys have been purposed in yourselves as educators to pour into students. Um, and a part of your assignment is to ensure that someone else gets a shot at reaching their full potential. Um, and I certainly commend you um, for that. So uh, this young fellow is the same gentleman who stands before you now. Um, in high school, I played a uh, wide receiver. Um, and that's actually my, uh, my girlfriend. Funny story about that, right? Um, we got voted cutest couple. Uh, so this was probably October, November. By the time the yearbook came out, we were already broken up. <laughs> Life happens, adversity. Um, I had a great time my senior year of high school. Um, played football, um, ended up making the all-city team. Uh, now, you know, granted, at the time, I was like 125 pounds, right? But uh, you know, I was a pretty decent athlete. Um, I made the uh, city team as a wide receiver, but I ended up playing quarterback a few games as well. Um, quarterback ended up getting his wrist broken, and um, I ended up uh, getting tapped to, uh, to, play, to play quarterback. Uh, we had one wide receiver play 
in the entire, path, uh, in entire playbook, and who knew that that now qualified me to lead an offense. Um, I ended up playing pretty well in the two games that I played. Um, and um, I ended up setting a, lead, a league record. I threw a 99-yard touchdown pass. Um, the pass itself was only like 15 yards, but <laughs> record books don't account for that, and that's neither here nor there. Um, but in my first game uh, as quarterback, um, I had a really, really um, impactful experience. Um, we're driving down uh, the field, moving the ball pretty well, and um, a quick reenactment. Um, I'm at quarterback. Coach sends the play in through our star running back. So he comes up. He's like, no motion quarterback sneak on one. Remember, I am 5'7", 125 pounds at the time. Coach is calling the quarterback sneak for me. I'm the quarterback. Calls the play in and, you know, no motion quarterback sneak on one. My response. What? Why is coach calling the quarterback sneak? Man, shut up and run the play. No motion, quarterback sneak on one. Ready? Get under center. Ready, set, hut. Run the quarterback sneak. I ended up getting like seven yards on the play. Great play, but the result of the play actually really isn't the significant piece here. I want you to see what happened at the beginning as that play was called. I had an emotional breakdown in the huddle, right? I'm thinking, hey, coach, do you not see the, uh, the, 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 the sheet that says how big I am? Why are you sending me into <laughs> the defensive line like this? This doesn't seem like a great play. But what I didn't realize was I had a team of people who were around me. I had in that exact moment, he was a good friend of mine, who was like, you ever see the cartoons where uh, you know, a guy has uh, gloves and he's like slapping somebody in his face? He's like, hey, shut up, snap out of it. That's what my, uh, my running back did, proverbially slapped me in the face, hey, shut up, run a play. Like, we got this, we practiced this, you got a line that's gonna execute, we know what we're doing. And that's exactly what happened. And that experience taught me the value of partnership, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, problems have a way of being more surmountable when we surround ourselves with other individuals. Um, and you don't have to rely on your own emotional and sometimes uh, inaccurate thinking to help get you through it. Um, that connection to others really becomes just that important. Um, you know, partnership provides an access to resources um, and, and the support to help get your thoughts oriented when we're in shaky ground. And we all are going to need someone. This life is very, very difficult and it's not meant to be experienced alone. So whether that's a professional, a therapist, a coach, a mentor, your family, your friends, um, having others around you, especially when you're not at your best, it's gonna provide a safety net for us for that emotional fall that sometimes may happen. And it also can be the launching pad to significant success. Because our resilience is dramatically increased when we don't have to rely on ourselves for that resilience. The last piece I wanna mention is the concept of peace. So there's a lot of times where we'll go through things and we fight against it. We'll continue to fight against the realities that have been set upon us. We'll continue to challenge and push back against all of the different stages of grief, whether that's in denial, whether that's in uh, the bargaining uh, that we'll do. That's all rooted in our inability to con just accept we're continually fighting, but there's another choice. We can always simply lay down our weapons and we can accept the things that we cannot change. We can make peace with a new reality and a new existence. I spoke earlier about lighting the fire and then all of a sudden we get rain. 
So we have some choices here. We could certainly go out and fight the clouds, right? That's producing this storm, that's producing all of this rain for us. But what if instead of fighting the clouds, which obviously we can all envision how futile that would be, right? Imagine trying to fight clouds. It's a losing battle every time. But what if instead of fighting the clouds, we instead had a healthy perspective about the rain that's coming and how it's ultimately going to grow us or nurture or provide for us? What if we put a plan together around how we're going to use the rain for our own good? What if we use the power that we have to protect ourselves from the storm that was coming? What if we simply persevere through the storm after everything that we've, we've done that we could? What if we had prepared for the storm and we knew that we can get some level of comfort and protection from the storm? What if we found a purpose in that storm and then used that storm for our good? And then what if we actually had someone to walk through the storm with us? We employed all, if we employed all of those things, we'd soon realize that the storm actually isn't as bad as, it, as we thought it was. And even if it is as bad as we think it is, that we're ultimately still gonna be okay, even if we get wet. Thank you guys very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I wish you all the best. <laughs>